Welcome to Talmud for the Curious, week five, February 15th, 2022. We're in the month of Adar 5782. So hello everyone. And as we've said, it's week five of Talmud for the Curious. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about something that's sort of personal. Uh, you may or may not know that both Sheldon and I are retired physicians. And in doing some research for this course, it became apparent that there's a lot of medical authority in the Talmud. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and as well as touching on some Jewish medical ethics uh, that are also referenced in the Talmud. I'm not sure what my doctor replacing my rabbi. Doctor replacing my rabbi. Morning. What type of prayer are you here for this morning? Um, morning prayer. Or my rabbi replacing my doctor. Be a bit odd. Say, ah, uh, ah, uh, olam, asher molach, beterem kol yitzur nivra. And so the there is a great medicine deal of medicine in the Talmud. And there is a long tradition of great physicians who were rabbis as well as doctors, the most famous being Moses Maimonides, who we referenced a little bit in last week's talk. Um, the role of prayer is very important in Judaism. Uh, there are, along with the mandate to heal, there are limits as to the role that physicians can play. And they work as partners with God in saving lives. I think it's important when you read the Talmud, you pick up that Jewish prayer should be recognized as an important and powerful healing tool that is an integral part of patient care. We have learned that there are two different Talmuds and they both deal with medical issues, but they deal with them a little bit differently. Uh, most of the rabbis who comment on medical advice were not physicians, few of them were, but they offered medical advice. And as we have also learned that context is very important. So I'm gonna give you a very brief little history of medicine to sort of set this up. There were actually two systems of medicine that the rabbis may have been exposed to. And depending upon which one they knew, color their medical advice. The rabbis in Israel were able to read Greek and they could access Greek medicine, which was what we think of as the forerunner to Western medicine. We've all heard of the Hippocratic Oath. So that's Hippocrates, who was born about 460 BC in the island of Kos. And he's credited with being the first person who sort of believed that diseases had natural causes and they were not some punishment, let's say, that was inflicted on you by the gods for something that you had done wrong. And if it was natural, then theoretically you could figure out a cause and a treatment. A name that you probably don't know is Galen, who is probably the most famous doctor and teacher of medicine in the Roman world. He was a very prolific writer. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of books, well over 4 million words. The reason Galen is so important is that his medical teachings became medical dogma. And for 1500 years, it's pretty amazing, for 1500 years, Galenic medicine was the medicine that was studied in Europe. And it wasn't until the Renaissance, 1500 years after his death, that things began to change. Um, Galen ex originated the experimental method and he did lots of dissections, but his dissections weren't animals. Human dissection was prohibited, which was where some of the errors subsequently came from. And the belief was that the body had natural humors. We still use this. We say that somebody is ill-humored. They're in a bad humor. Um, they are humorous. 
These come from Galenic medicine because there were four humors. There was red bile or cull, and we say somebody's choleric, or black bile, and we use the word melancholy. That's where it comes from. Uh, and the way, if you believed in Galen, you use diet, purging, bloodletting, uh, were the kind of treatments that you had. And these were the rabbis who could read Greek. The rabbis in Babylon, and we talked so much about the Babylonian community, they weren't exposed to Greek, couldn't read it, but they could read Aramaic. So what could they read? They could access Babylonian medicine. So Babylonian medicine was sort of more traditional in attributing diseases to demons and external factors. And their treatments consisted of prayers to the various gods and the administration of herbs and potions, either orally or rectally. So when the rabbis adopted and quoted medicine, it depends which, which system they were familiar with. And again, in Babylon, a little bit more familiar with Babylonian. And this is what a Babylonian medical tablet, this is written in Arcadian. And again, this is how it was organized. And this would have been the medicine that the rabbis were familiar with. There are three commentators primarily in the Babylonian time that talk about health issues. I found this very interesting. Rabbi Abaye, and if I pronounce it wrong, jump in and I'm doing the best I can. Abaye. Rabbi Abaye. Abaye uh, he was a leading proponent of Babylonian medicine. I found it funny. He starts his comments with, my mother told me. You know it's going to be him because he says, my mother told me. What I found interesting when reading about him, he was an orphan. His parents died when he was very little and he was raised by an aunt and an uncle, but he always prefaces it by this. Rabbi Yohanan, okay, who probably knew a little Greek and Roman medicine because he was in Palestine, was renowned for his physical beauty. We don't necessarily think of rabbis or rap, male or female uh, as natural beauties, but he was renowned for it and Samuel of Nehardia, um, who is also known as Mar Samuel. He was actually a rabbi, physician, and a noted astronomer. And he studied under Rabbi Hanasi in Palestine. And you all, I'm sure, remember that Ronnie, Rabbi Hanasi was the person who codified and wrote down the Mishnah. When I practiced medicine for 40 years, I was an ophthalmologist. So I was particularly interested in eye diseases. And Mark Samuel, so was he. And he spent 18 months living with a shepherd to study eye diseases in animals. He also developed his own proprietary ointment, hence his name, Mark Samuel. And he treated and cured Rabbi Hanasi of an eye problem. And this is from the Talmud. And Rabbi Hanasi had pain in his eye and he would put a, wanted to put some medication in his eye. And Hanasi said, no, no, don't put the medicine in my eye. I'm afraid it's going to hurt. So Shmuel said, well, okay, I'll put it above your eye and a salve. And he said, even that I cannot bear. So Shmuel put the medication in a tube of herbs underneath his pillow and supposedly Hanasi was healed. I don't know why I had to deal with emergencies. I should have just told them to put a tube of ointment under their pillow. It would have saved me a lot of work. Uh, Talmudic medicine, in Talmudic medicine, physicians were generalists. They are expected to treat everything. The Talmud offers medical advice as it relates to legal cases, hygiene, and biblical law. For instance, Jews were advised not to live in a city that didn't have doctors. Physicians were supposed to be paid for their services. A physician heals for nothing is worth nothing. On the other hand, we still have this balancing act. Doctors were supposed to get paid, but they weren't supposed to get rich helping people practicing medicine. They used a variety of herbal medicines to treat. 
um, their patients. So the other thing, of course, that comes up is what is a physician's role in terms of the Sabbath? How do you balance observing the Sabbath with taking care of patients? So the violation of the Sabbath by a physician for health reasons is permissible, but only under certain circumstances. The rabbis disagreed as to whether the laws of the Sabbath are totally inoperative or temporarily suspended in order to save a life. But the bottom line is that you are supposed to try to minimize the violation of the Sabbath as much as possible. So for instance, a life-threatened patient, the Sabbath is like a weekday for somebody whose life is in danger. As a matter of fact, there's an injunction that a physician who takes precious time to ask questions about whether or not the Sabbath is, is being violated is considered to have, quote, shed blood, because any delay in treatment of an emergency situation could adversely affect the patient's outcome. So what is a physician to do? For instance, the physician might delay treatment if it's a non-emergency. So if you need an x-ray, but it's not an emergency, that x-ray may get delayed till Sabbath is over. Even it's stated even before a Jew turns off the light to let a seriously ill patient sleep, the doctor should explore alternatives such as covering the lights or moving the patient to another room. So you do what you need to do, but you're supposed to be mindful of the Sabbath. People are not fully autonomous over their own bodies and lives, but receive them from God and hold them in trust. This becomes difficult now because Jewish scholars distinguish between acts which shorten a person's life and those which prevent the unnecessary delay of death. The latter are permitted, the former are not. There is an obligation on the part of the patient to seek medical care. A person is not entitled to refuse medical care except for very few reasons. As a result, Judaism does not countenance suicide, nor is one permitted to facilitate suicide. The situation, of course, and this is what the Talmud about, is complicated. For instance, Samson is not condemned for suicide. He says, let me die with the Philistines. So he pulls the temple down, he kills all the Philistines, he kills himself. So is religious martyrdom an acceptable alternative to this? I'm not going to go into this in the interest of time, but you could see this gets very complicated. What is the role of the physician? Jewish law forbids active euthanasia and regards it as murder. There really, as far as I can understand, and again, Rabbi, you'll jump in whenever, there are no exceptions to this rule. In shortening life, it is wrong to shorten a life even if it would end very soon because every moment of human life is considered equal in value to many years of life. But it gets complicated. What about passive euthanasia, like withholding or withdrawing therapy that can keep someone alive? You can find uh, evidence in the Talmud sort of both ways. Rabbi Moshe Izerlis said, if there is anything which causes a hindrance to the departure of the soul, it is permissible to remove it from there because there's no act involved, only the removal of the impediment. What about end of life? There is a limit to the duty to keep people alive. If someone's life is ending and they are in serious pain, doctors have no duty to make that person suffer more by artificially extending their dying moments. It is also, however, very acceptable to ask God in prayer to remove a patient from their pain and their suffering. So I will throw this open if we have five or 10 minutes. As 
we're all older, we've all had to deal with death. So how guided are you by Talmudic medical ethics when you have to make these kinds of decisions uh, for loved ones? Uh, any comments, Rabbi or anybody else? When I have had to guide someone who said, can I pull the plug? These were the rulings that I was uh, looking at and considering. And I told the story of Rabbi uh, Judah, Rabbi Yehuda, who was suffering terribly. He was about to die, but he was still alive. And all of his students were surrounding him in the house and praying, 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 so that the angel of death could not approach. His handmaiden went to the roof and took a, a, a clay jug and she threw it down from the roof and it crashed. And in that moment of hearing the crash, the students stopped their prayers. And in that moment, Rabbi Judah's soul left and he ended his pain and his suffering and he died. And on the basis of that anecdotal story, that Agadah, uh, that is where they say you can remove something that is uh, preventing the natural death process. So interesting, the way they talk about it in the Talmud. Um, I actually did some research on end of life issues, very much illustrating exactly what you were speaking about, Richard, and it's pages upon pages of what if, but what if, but on the other hand, because every case is different. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes, absolutely. I didn't understand when you made the comment about the impediment. And I think the rabbi's story is one such example, which makes it understandable to me. To re you're allowed to remove an impediment, and it, it made no sense till I heard your story. Thank you. Great. Uh, do I, Jenny? Do I have to? Did I lose my screen share? Do I have to? Anita has her hand up. Yeah, there's there's an I issue have... about um, if somebody's on life support that if they are on life support in Israel, they're not going to take you off life support unless you have it set up ahead of time that the life support should go for X number of hours. And then if you happen not to be in the room when it ends, then the life can end. But oh, it's very sticky once you get on life support amongst the ultra Orthodox and in Israel, just generally speaking. It's true. Can you still see my screen? There's something. Um, no, you would, you, Richard, you'll need to uh, share screen again in order to, to bring your PowerPoint back. You can see each other right now. Yeah, but I lost Jenny. Um, you can hear me now, right, Richard? Yep. Okay, go ahead and go share screen and yep. it'll bring well, your PowerPoint back up. Yes, well, I don't because when it jumped off, when the rabbi came on, I don't have that icon. I'm sorry. It's not. I mean, I can go to the, go to the three dots at the bottom where it says more, and then no, go no. to share I, screen. I, know, I I I know where I'm supposed to be going, but they're not there right now. It, so it, let me let me see. I got. I think I've got it now. Just hang on one second. Okay. It popped out. Better. Uh. Yep. Now you're good. Great. So the. Let me just get back to where I was. It's a good review. <laughs> Sorry. So the Talmud also references a little bit about surgery. It's interesting, there's only two procedures are mentioned. You can take it on or take it off. There's circumcision, which is mandatory, and castration, which is prohibited. There were no surgeons as such. It was all done by general doctors. And as you can imagine, it was pre anesthetic and pre-antibiotic. Uh, so the surgeons were, or the doctors were skilled at doing certain things like sewing up wounds, amputations. Um, if they did a little, what's called a craniotomy, opening your skull, they closed it with a pumpkin peel. Uh, so you can imagine things were a little bit different than what they did today. Uh, but they were aware of hygiene in terms of washing hands and attempting before major operations to give some type of sedation or a sleeping draught or alcohol, goblets of wines, or some types of sleeping potions as best they could 
to minimize the discomfort. But as you can imagine, surgery back then was very risky. I just want to talk for a little bit uh, about blindness, because the Bible has a high appreciation of vision. Uh, and blindness was something that, well, they couldn't necessarily diagnose, but you could visualize, especially external things. Um, and so being blind, of course, was a horrible misfortune. And there were certain prescriptions for it. Um, so, for instance, when a man strikes at the eye of a slave and destroys its use, he had to emancipate the slave for damaging his eye. Uh, eye diseases would disqualify a person from the priesthood or the animal from being a proper sacrifice uh, if their eyes were diseased or deformed. A priest could be disqualified from performing his priestly duties if he lost his eyelashes, for instance. And of course, there's various um, cures and remedies. For instance, the saliva of the firstborn heals eye diseases. Um, I'm a firstborn, in case you need any help, let me know. Uh, Jews were very familiar with eye defects. Um, Isaac and Jacob uh, were, I, Israel's eyes were very heavy with age. He could not see. He probably had what we call ptosis, which is droopy eyelids. They both apparently suffered from what sounds like cataracts. On the other hand, Moses, at the age of 120, was still had clear vision. So they were very much aware of it. Um, understanding the cause of disease, of course, was limited. So the following sort of gives you some idea. According to the Talmud, if a pregnant woman eats garden cress, she will have blurry-eyed children. If she eats fish brine, the children will have unsteady blinking eyes. But if she eats eggs, the children will have big eyes. So there, there's this advice for pregnant women. Um, as I mentioned, Rabbi Samuel in particular was recognized. Uh, and he said, a drop of cold water into the eye and the washing of hands and feet are better than all the ointments in the world. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump over uh, a couple of things. Um, they recommended natural remedies, of course, honey, um, is very good for your eyes. So was young kale, cull sprouts, or asparagus. So again, so a very, a very holistic, naturopathic approach to medicine uh, was, is in the Talmud even from so many years ago. And then I came, I was doing pretty well in my research until I came across this. The best of doctors go to hell. It sort of stopped me for a little bit. As a physician, it was like, okay, where are they going with this? So let's talk about where are we going with this? So any suggestions or I'll just go through a slide and then we'll talk about it. So what can this mean? Well, this line can criticize doctors who treat the disease but do not care for the patient as a suffering patient. So a good clinician, but not a feeling doctor. Physicians who lack sufficient humility, believing they know everything and fail to ask the help when they reach the limits of their knowledge. There's sort of a one line joke. What's the difference between God and a cardiothoracic surgeon? God doesn't think he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. <laughs> okay, so humility. Three, a treatment may help one patient but harm or kill another. And so even the most well-intentioned doctor may harm a patient or commit an error. Or a physician should act as if hell itself is open before him if his treatments kill the patient. In this way, he will always act with caution and diligence. The best of physicians is one who acts as if he might one day inherit hell, unless he is appropriately careful and attentive. And I found in doing a little bit of research, of course, Sheldon has taught us so much about Rashi. So of course, Rashi 
has a comment. This is his explanation. The best of doctors go to hell. The doctor does not fear illness. His food is that of the robust. That is the doctor is keeping everything for himself. He's eating the best of everything, but not sharing it. He breaks, does not break his heart before God. That is to mean that God is a partner with the doctors in healing. If the doctor becomes that arrogant that he doesn't think he needs God, he does not break his heart. Sometimes he causes people to die. Sometimes he does commit malpractice. He makes a mistake. And he has the ability to heal the poor, but does not. Patient can't afford to pay. I know what's wrong with you. You can't pay. I'm not interested. So it's an interesting thing. So let me ask the group as a final thing. How would you interpret this? Or what is the most important factors to you that makes a doctor a good one? Maybe one who should not end up in hell. Comments? Yes. Linda? Uh, yeah. Does research, if someone has something that he's not familiar with and calls for assistance or tries to research uh, what they're looking at rather than just dismissing the patient with, oh, we'll take this, it works for, you know, 99% of the people. Uh, because I think today in our society, just give somebody a pill and it's supposed to cure. Well, I will tell you as somebody who practiced, you know, for 40 years, in all the time that I practiced, okay. I never sent a patient for a second opinion that the patient okay. didn't appreciate it. Because yeah. They recognize the fact you can't know everything about everything. And if you're able to admit, look, I think I know what to do, but I want somebody who has more experience, patients are very appreciative of that. So it's important to be humble as a doctor. I agree. Rabbi? There's such a thing as bedside manner. And we're <laughs> treating the, the symptoms, we're treating the patient as a person, just as you had on your slide. And Yitzhak recently had surgery, and it was only when we finally got to physical therapy, he said, finally, somebody's touching me. And, you know, we've gotten to be where the, the, the doctor looks at the patient and then sits in front of the computer and figures out what medicine to give. But there's no none of this hands on healing, which really helps putting a hand on someone's uh, shoulder or thigh or 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 somewhere, you know, to say, I want to connect with you. And it's part of the diagnosis and it's part of the healing. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, one of the hardest things was bringing this, you know, the computer into the office mm -hmm. because it's easy to turn your back on the patient and you're typing away. Uh, so I, in my practice, we ended up, I had a scribe. I had somebody who I would verbally talk to them and they would type it in. So this way I could continue with my exam, but I could directly face the patient and have the conversation. Anita? Yeah, as part of this, seeing the whole person. So I mean, when I go to the cardiologist, all he is interested in is my cardiology function. He doesn't care about the kidneys. He doesn't care about anything else, just cardiology. And, you know, with the nephrologist, his, he was a little bit better than that, but basically it was just the nephrology and had, having been a pharma, pharmacist, he was also interested in pharmacology, but also listening and answering your questions, but also listening to, you might have some input yourself that might, because you know yourself. Right, and you know how you react to things. And we all have our own idiopathic ways of relating to different medications and different treatments. So I think, you know, all of these are part of dealing with the patient as a whole person, doing the research and touching, you know, when possible. <laughs> it's like kind of weird today, but, um, you know, just all this whole, seeing the holistic. I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think that people want 
the human touch. It's, and I think that's, that hasn't changed in 2000 years. It's probably never changed. Um, so, her, uh, Sheila. I'm sorry? Teaching medical students, interviewing and counseling in, well, in a medical school. And we interviewed them and they got to see what they looked like interviewing patients. Uh, and they were often very shocked. The good ones thought they were wonderful and the bad ones were a lot better than they thought they were. The thing that we put the most emphasis, what, that I put the most emphasis on, and Anita just said it, it was listen, listen, listen. Your patients will tell you who they are and what that you have to offer they'll listen to. They'll probably tell you what's really wrong and they might even tell you what they need to be healed. And I, it, it was a privilege and I loved it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end my part of this in the interest of staying on schedule and turn this over to Sheldon. Thank you, Richard. You're uh, welcome. Two comments. The, you asked um, what makes the best doctors, and I think the doctors who can teach Talmud are probably the best. Us. Oh, thank you, Sheldon. <laughs> we get two little gold stars and we're done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and the second thing, you brought up a point that although uh, the people in the land of Israel and people in doctors in Babylon were relatively close over a land bridge, they had two entirely different philosophies. And we would think that they would have the same philosophy, but the land of Israel was conquered and occupied by both Greece and Rome. So their political, military, and social focus were directly up across the Mediterranean to Southern Europe, Greece, and Italy. The doctors who lived in Babylon were part of the Persian empire, which Greece and Rome did not occupy. So they had a whole different culture and they were Zoroastrian as opposed to the Greek and Roman religion. So the um, Israel, focused across the Mediterranean, whereas Babylon focused along North Africa, Alexandria, and subsequently into Spain. So that's, I think, why they have two different, uh, two different philosophies. Can I jump in for a second? Um, you can Google, and perhaps Anita will find it and put it in the chat, the uh, directive to the physician, which is uh, attributed to Maimonides. And it's beautiful. And before I had some surgery a few years ago, uh, I talked to Anita, we looked at the prettiest font and the nicest paper, I printed it out and I gave it to the surgeon, I gave it to the nurses, they put it on the wall, and I hope it guided their hands beautifully. When I graduated medical school, I, we, they administered the oath of Maimonides. We didn't take the Hippocratic oath, but where I went to medical school was the oath of Maimonides, is what we took. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will begin with Chavruta, which is how Jewish students study Talmud. Then I will discuss Talmud in South Korea. Then we look at Aramaic in Jewish history. And then we will explore what the internet can bring to Talmud study. We begin with Chavruta, how Jews study Talmud. Jenny, please. If you go into a modern university library where students study alone, it is very quiet. Contrast this traditional study library with a study hall in a yeshiva. Yeshiva study is noisy because it's chavruta, a dialogue between study partners, and it's supposed to be loud. Let's look at a short video clip of Telsha Yeshiva in Chicago. Jenny, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
Chavruta is an Aramaic word meaning friendship or companionship. Chavruta study, Chavruta learning is a study method used in yeshiva since Talmudic time. It's a Jewish method of interactive learning and solving problems through dialogue between students and pairs, talking, discussing, and debating with each other. The Talmud says, there is more to learn from a friend than to learn from a teacher. Also, two scholars sharpen one another. Rabbis encourage students to find the right study partner. A yeshiva student may spend 10 hours a day learning in a Havruta. So the choice of Havruta is often based on friendship and having the right partner is important. In a class of 20 students, class rabbis may switch Havruta around eight or nine times until the partnerships work for both sides. In Orthodox Judaism, Havruta refers to two or three students. Reform Judaism Havruta may have five people studying together. Unlike a typical student-teacher relationship where the student memorizes and then repeats the material back in the test, Havruta style learning, the student first analyzes the text, organizes his thoughts logically, verbally explains their reasoning to their partner, listens to their partner's reasoning, and then points out errors in their partner's reasoning. They question, debate, argue, and they hone each other's ideas and often develop new insights into the meaning of the text. If a Havruta needs help on a difficult problem, they turn to the rabbis or the lecturers. Next slide, please. In 2013, the American Behavioral Science Research Institute studied memory retention 24 hours after studying in different ways. With passive learning, Memory retention is poor. 24 hours after listening, reading, or watching a film, only a small amount of material is retained. But after active learning, like Havruta study, memory retention improved with teaching it to someone else being the best way to retain material. So the more involved you are with the study material, like in a Havruta, the more you remember. Slide off, please. Havruta learning tends to be loud and animated, as we saw, as study partners read the Talmud aloud to each other, then analyze, debate, and defend their points of view. In large yeshivas, dozens or even hundreds of Havrutas may be discussing and debating their opinions, and students have to learn to block out all other discussions and focus only on their study partner. In this way, Havruta style Talmud learning actually retains the oral laws, oral character. Just as nations sought to destroy Judaism by prohibiting Talmud study, other nations want to emulate Judaism by learning how to study Talmud. Next slide, please. In 2011, the South Korean ambassador to Israel was interviewed on Israeli public television. The ambassador said, each Korean family has at least one copy of the Talmud. Korean mothers want to know how so many Jewish people became geniuses. 23% of Nobel Prize winners are Jewish people. And Koreans want to know the secret. And they find the secret in this book, the Talmud. Slide off, please. Some Koreans view Jews as the model of academic excellence. And since the 1970s, they've tried to teach Jewish educational practices to their children. They try to emulate the Talmudic Havruta learning process and to teach their children their idea of Talmud. Next slide, please. Here we see a book that says Talmud with Korean letters and a Star of David. The Korean Talmud is short and simplified and has many cartoons. It is sold in bookstores, convenience stores like 7-Eleven, and vending machines. A search for Korean Talmud on Amazon.com showed seven pages of Talmud books for Koreans. Most Koreans, though, 
have really no idea that there is a real Talmud beyond the Korean Talmud. Next slide, please. South Koreans teach Talmud to their children beginning in elementary school. This is a Talmud picture story with Korean characters and Korean writing in the upper right corner. There is even a prenatal Talmud for pregnant mothers who want to encourage brain development in the womb. Slide off, please. Most South Koreans have never met a Jew and know little about how Jews live. Koreans are not interested in Jewish religion. They only want to copy how Jews teach their children. There are now dozens of Haruta-style schools around the country catering to everyone from toddlers to adults. Students enroll with the goal of receiving a Jewish education in addition to a Korean one. Next slide, please. This is an interesting Korean business success Talmud. And this may be one reason Koreans study Talmud. Here is a two minute video that appeared on South Korean television. It shows Koreans researching Israeli yeshivas to learn the secrets of Jewish study. Jenny, please. Uh, is it the next? It's the video. Is it on this one? One more, no, after that. Oh, here. That's it. Israel에서 릴리가 가장 먼저 소개해 주고 싶어 했던 곳은 예시바였다. 예시바는 전 세계 유태인이 사는 곳이면 어디든지 있는 이들의 도서관이다. 도서관이라고 하기에는 믿기지 않을 만큼 시끄러운 곳으로 유태인 공부의 특징이 잘 살아 있는 곳이다. I'm here at a library. Although it's more of a unique place because it's a place where Jews study. And I'm going to take a look at how Jews actually use this unique study method. So let's go take a look together. So the first thing that I noticed in here is actually just the noise level. You know, you see a lot of people talking with each other and, um, you know, having debates and conversations. And that's not something that you normally think of when you think of a library. I know that at Harvard, it's totally silent when people are studying, um, but here, people are talking and having conversations and that's actually studying for them because you know the Jewish method of learning isn't just about reading the text and memorizing the text it's about engaging in a dialogue not only with the text but also with another person or several people to discuss it and through this you're able to develop your opinions and really you know take the lessons from from the text in a more meaningful manner 이들이 공부하는 것은 탈무드. 그러나 누구도 이 책을 혼자 읽거나 외우지 않는다. Okay. Within its own manner, a big pile of salt can't talk which is useless. It, it lacks the ability to be made on where they're coming from, which is a bad situation for future relationships and future development of the world. Basically because then it stops then and there. Yeah. So khash rashon khoresh. 그들에게 책이란 토론을 위한 Thank you, Jenny. South Korea is studying Talmud light. Havruta style learning may be useful in general, but it remains to be seen if studying the Jewish Talmud without the Jewish part is helpful. Havruta, which means friends or fellowship, is an Aramaic word. And we've mentioned Aramaic in almost every class. So what is Aramaic? What is its place in Jewish history? Why is the Gemara in the Talmud written solely in Aramaic? Next slide, please. In Western history, early writing systems included Egyptian hieroglyphics on top and cuneiform writing on the bottom. Hieroglyphics used pictograms 
while cuneiform writing uses wedges driven into wet mud and allowed to dry. These systems were difficult to use and required extensive training by scribes. Slide off, please. Ancient Phoenicia, near present-day Lebanon, developed a new alphabet where one symbol represented one letter or sound, like today's Latin alphabet. This new invention changed the way people wrote and spelled. The new alphabet became the basis for all Semitic languages, including Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, as well as later Greek and our modern day Latin alphabet. We have dug deeply into our synagogue archives, and we have an actual picture of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. On the tablets, you see an early form of ancient Hebrew letters, which later morphed into the square block Hebrew letters we use today. Jenny, please. The written symbols on the tablets called Paleo-Hebrew or Proto-Hebrew appear to be historically correct. Next slide, please. Aramaeans were ancient tribes that occupied biblical Aram in upper Mesopotamia. Here we see Aram in northern Mesopotamia with Assyria and Babylonia to the east and Phoenicia and Israel to the southwest. Slide off, please. In the ninth century BCE, Aramaeans modified the new Phoenician alphabet into an Aramaic alphabet using square block letters we use in Hebrew. Aram was then conquered by Assyria, which was later conquered by Babylonia. And as the Aramaeans were forced to relocate all over the Middle East, their new alphabet spread over the entire area. Assyria and Babylon may have conquered Aram, but the Aramaic language conquered Assyria and Babylonia. Aramaic spread throughout the Middle East and became the lingua franca, the common language of the Middle East until the Arabic conquest in the seventh century CE. Let's look at this two minute video about Aramaeans. The Aramaeans greatest contribution to world history was their language. In order to help prevent massive revolts, as well as make certain areas of the empire more productive, most new Assyrian kings had a policy of deporting the surviving populations of their conquered enemies to other areas of their realm. Perhaps the most well-known instance of this was the deportation of the surviving population of the northern kingdom of Israel by Sargon II. It's likely that within a generation or two, such populations were assimilated into their new surroundings with their distinct culture and language slowly being phased out of existence. Interestingly enough, this was not the case for the Aramaeans. In fact, the destruction and deportations of Aramaean populations actually expanded their influence all over the ancient Middle East, especially with regard to their language. Because the Aramaeans were arguably the most populous of the various peoples during the Iron Age, their dispersal by the Assyrians led to large numbers of them ending up in all parts of Greater Assyria, Babylonia, Southwestern Anatolia, and of course, the Levant. Due to this, Aramaic became the lingua franca, or main language of communication, throughout the region, replacing even Akkadian, which for over a thousand years had previously been the standard international language of diplomacy. Aramaic was also relatively easy to use because its written form used an alphabetic script that was modified from that developed by the Phoenicians, which made writing it and using it for quick correspondence much more practical than the old cuneiform script that had up until then been the standard. Despite the widespread adoption of the Aramaic language and script, there's actually very little written about the Aramaeans, their history, and culture outside of Assyrian and biblical texts. During the Babylonian captivity in the sixth century BCE, the language spoken by Jews began to change from Hebrew to Aramaic and square block letters replaced the ancient Hebrew alphabet on Moses tablets. When the Jews returned to Israel from Babylonian exile, they brought Aramaic back with them. Knowledge of Hebrew was decreasing 
and a public reading of Torah in Hebrew had to be accompanied by a public translation in Aramaic so people could understand Torah. Hebrew, the holy tongue, was reserved for prayer and not used in ordinary life. A similar situation developed centuries later in Eastern Europe with Yiddish used in ordinary life and Hebrew reserved for prayer. In the Hebrew Bible, Aramaic accounts for about 250 verses out of a total of over 23,000 verses, or about 1% of the Hebrew Bible is written in Aramaic. Aramaic later became so dominant that the Talmud of Gemara was written entirely in Aramaic, which had become the language of the people at that time. Also, parts of the books of Daniel and Ezra are in Aramaic, as are parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Passover Haggadah, the words, my father was a wandering Aramaic, are written in Aramaic, along with the section, ha Anya, this is the bread of affliction, the matzah. And of course, the popular Hadgadja, one little goat, sung at the end of the meal. The Jewish marriage contract, the ketubah, and Jewish divorce degrees are in Aramaic. So is the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead, and Kol Nidre, recited on Yom Kippur Eve. The Zohar, the basic text of Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, is also in Aramaic. Consider a document written in English, side by side with a document written in French. Both use the same Latin alphabet. We know that they're different languages, but to a person who doesn't know Latin script, these languages would look the same. And so it is with Aramaic and Hebrew. Both languages use the same square block letters, but the words, the punctuation, and the grammar are different. Aramaic has been around for over 3,000 years. It later evolved into the language of the Syriac Christian Church. And there are still several thousand people in Syria who still speak Aramaic. Any part of our Jewish liturgy that is written in Aramaic was probably written before the seventh century CE, while Aramaic was still the common language of the Jewish people. After the seventh century, Arabic became the common language and Aramaic declined. Now we have seen how the oral law was written down to become the written Talmud. Then we saw how the written Talmud became the printed Talmud. Today, we look at the internet, which offers unlimited access to a digital Talmud free of charge to anyone around the world. Each technological advancement presented new opportunities for Jewish study and learning. I'm gonna show you two Talmud websites, which I consider exceptional. First, we'll look at Safaria, safaria.org. It is a nonprofit Jewish organization which offers a free library of Jewish texts in Hebrew and in English. It features a free digital edition of the Babylonian Talmud in a newer, more user-friendly format with lots, of, with lots of English that we'll see in a little while. It also includes Rabbi Aiden Steinsaltz's complete Hebrew and English translation of the Talmud. Next slide, please. Rabbi Steinsaltz is considered one of the greatest rabbis of the last two centuries, and he died two years ago. As his biography states, Rabbi Steinsaltz was the only person in the last 1,000 years to complete a new translation and commentary on the Hebrew Bible and the Babylonian Talmud. The last person to do that was the medieval commentator Rashi, who died in 1105, 1,000 years ago. It took Rabbi Steinsaltz 45 years to complete his Talmud translation. It is published by Koran Publishers in Jerusalem in 42 volumes. Next slide, please. Here is the first page of Rabbi Steinsaltz's Koran Talmud. It has a new page format, but preserves the traditional Talmud page number. In the left upper corner, we see Parak 1, or chapter one, 
Daf 2, or page 2, Amud A, side A. On the far left in Hebrew is the Mishnah. The English translation is prominent in the center. We see the first Mishnah question, which we're all familiar with, from when in the evening do we recite the Shema? To the far right, we see the Halakha, or Jewish law governing the issue at hand. Below that is a biography of the rabbis involved. And below the Mishnah, which we really can't see in this page, are additional background notes. And the Gemara begins on the next page. Slide off, please. Rabbi Steinsalz is also the author of the Essential Talmud, a reference book, which I used for this course. Now, let's look at the website. And I'm going to share my scene, my screen, as we look at the at the websites. So this is Safaria.org, and here we come on the home page. This is free. It has all the Jewish books here. It has Tanakh, which is the Torah, the Talmud, Halakha, Jewish law, liturgy the Siddur, Passover, Haggadah, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. We see here on this side is the Torah portion for the week, the Haftorah for the week, and Daf Yomi, the page for the, uh, the Talmud uh, day page. We look at the Tanakh. The first five books represents only the first third of the Torah. Deuteronomy ends as the Hebrews are about to cross the River Jordan, but that's not the end of the story. It continues in the second part, the prophets, where Joshua continues and conquers the land and continues chronologically until the last prophet, Malachi. And this comes where the Jews return from Babylon exile and build the second Torah. The third part of the Hebrew Bible is the writings this, this section is otherwise known as wisdom literature. Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations. Now let's say I wanna look at a Psalm. I click on Psalms. There are 150 Psalms. I click on the first page, first chapter, and here's the first chapter. I see this A and alpha here. I click on this. If I want the Psalms only in Hebrew, here it is only in Hebrew. If I want the Psalms only in English, here it is only in English. If I prefer them both, the Aleph and the A, here is what we're used to. If I click on this, if I want to learn more about it, I see on the side comes up these resources at all. There's 66 commentaries on this Psalm. I click on the commentary. Oh, here's three Rashi commentaries on Psalm 1. I click on Rashi, and here he is, the praises of the man that goes through the Psalms. If I want to know, what does this word mean, Ashray? I double click it. And here's a dictionary. Happy is the man who has not followed the counsel of the wicked. Happy, Aish is the man, Asher, who, etc. You can go on and on. So you want commentary, you want dictionary, you want Psalms, you want pro Proverbs, here it is. We go back to the text, Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud. We have six orders, seders. Barachot is what we've been looking at with the Shema question. We click on that. We see chapter one begins on two. We know that there's no chapter one. We click on that. And here it is. From when does one recite the Shema in the evening? We want it Hebrew. We want it only English. We want it both. We click on this. We get commentaries. We click on this. We have Rashi. And here he is. From what time do we do it? Until the end of the first watch. He explains. So everything here that we've looked at and struggled with that people over millennia had to go back and forth through the Talmud is now a click away. Halakha, we spoke about the Mishnah Torah, which was Maimonides' uh, 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 volume, and he was criticized because he said, this is all you need. The Shulchan Aruch, we spoke about 
last time, where the Sephardic Yosef Karo was joined by the Ashkenazi Rabbi uh, Israelis to uh, do a compromise Shulchan Aruch, which is the uh, most accepted code of Jewish law. And the liturgy. Here's the Siddur. Here's the Haggadah. And Kabbalah. If you want to learn Zohar, it's here. Now, I think it was Diane who asked early on in the course, did the Talmud connect not only with the Torah itself, but with other parts of the Bible? And my comment now was, I asked Diane to please hold that question because we have a lovely diagram that's going to show all this beautifully. And here it is. Now's the time. So this is a uh, visualization of the connections between the Talmud and Tanakh, the Bible. We also have, you could do for Talmud and Mishnah Torah, and et cetera. So we go back here to the Talmud and the Tanakh. The first five books of the Torah are listed here. Here we have the prophets on top. And in green, we see the wisdom literature, the Psalms, Proverbs, et cetera. I want to know how many times does Deuteronomy reference, and on the bottom, I'm sorry, on the bottom, we have all 63 tractates of Talmud. Barachot is what we were looking at here. So if I want to say how many times does the book Deuter Deuteronomy connect with the Talmud, this is how many times. And if I want to see exactly which one, well, first, I click on Deuteronomy. Now we've isolated just Deuteronomy on top. All the chapters are here. And here we have just one tractate, Yevamot. And these are all the connections between Deuteronomy and this single tractate. If I want to find out what one looks like, I'll say, click on this one. This says that chapter 11, verse 16 of Deuteronomy is going to reference the tractate Yevamot, page 78, B, the second side, sentence or verse 14. I click on it, and here it is, 78, B, 14. And all the other things that I could change and look at. So uh, we go back. You all to knock. And all of Tom. Now, if I want to see how many places in the Bible Barachot references, then I click on Barachot. And here we see on the top all the Bible books, and we see 2A, 6B, 10B of Barachot only. And these are the connections that this single tractate, Barachot in Talmud, connects all across with all the sections in the Bible. Exodus, I'm looking now at what Barachot references only Exodus. And again, if I want to look at this one, I'm looking here at Exodus 2720. And here it is. So the um, I think this is an amazing thing that they've done here with these connections. So we're going to go back. Sorry. Okay. So here we are at the home page. We've looked at the text and the connections. Remember the rabbi said a uh, session or two ago that in Safaria, any Jewish topic you want to click on, you could probably find something on. So we look at topics. And here I'm going to look at social issues. And the rabbi mentioned abortion, social issues. I click on abortion. And here are the source materials for everything to do with abortion. Mishnah, this is a, uh, uh, a Gemara. Uh, here we have Genesis, another Mishnah, all of the actual source material for this. And we have related material, fetuses, medical ethics. And now there's this other thing here called sheets. If you click on sheets, 
these, this allows people to make their own uh, commentaries. They build their own statements and pull out different parts of the Talmud or the Bible and create their own commentary on a topic. So, and all of this is free. So the second, I'm going to leave this alone now, and I'm now going to go to the second website, the Merkava. This is the Merkava.com. We see here that, and it's, sorry. This is their homepage. We see up this on beta, meaning that it's still in progress. It's not fully fleshed out. We have the weekly parasha, the Torah portion here. And over here, we see the daf yomi. We come down, try it now, to the Talmud. Again, we see one, two, three, four, five, six seders, or six orders, followed by 63 tractates. The Jerusalem Talmud has the same six Mishnah. There's only one Mishnah, but two Gemaras, both the Bavli, the Babylonian, and the Rushalmi used the same Mishnah that was written by Rabbi Judah the Prince, but the rabbis after him in Jerusalem and Babylonia wrote different Gemara. So we've been looking at Barachot, 2A. This is more a traditional page that we've been used to looking at. First, I double click here. And we can see the beauty of this Rashi script and how different it looks from the block script in Hebrew. Double click, it goes back. Here we have the beginning of a tractate, which is always highlighted. And then I'm going to click here on the magic marker. And we see that the Mishnah lights up in different colors. The beauty of this website is they have broken down the Mishnah and the Gemara into six different sections. The Mishnah and the Gemara consist of statements, proofs, attacks, defense, questions like this, and answers. And the English is here on the bottom. So this yellow part is from what time may one say the Shema in the evening. We know that, we've gone over that. If we want to click on the next part, or I'll do it down here, the purple lights up and that's the answer from the time the colony entered to eat their turuma. And I can click on and on, the English changes at the bottom, and we're continuing down in the answer. We continue until here, yellow is a question. Just, then why did the sages say until midnight? That's a question. We see the GM, Gemara, that's the Gemara. And they ask another question. And then again, it's answered. Then we come to pink, which is an attack. If that's so, blah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then someone asks a question and they defend it and it goes on and on and on. And page two and three and four. So I'm gonna leave this here, but this is the second website that I found exceptional how somebody can do this using modern technology. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Coming back. So today we discussed how Jewish students study Talmud in Chavrutis. We saw how South Koreans hope to emulate Jewish learning by using Talmud light. We explore the history of Aramaic and how it became embedded in Jewish holy books. And finally, we saw two digital Talmud platforms, which will help revolutionize Talmud study. And now I'm gonna turn the program over to one of my Kavruta partners, Rabbi Miguel. That was amazing and brilliant. Let's give him some love there. That's just beautiful. Thank you. We'll all be using Safari in a different way. Uh, take a moment, please. Breathe, stretch. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Boremi Mizonot, because I have a cookie. When you drink something, you want to be sweet and you want to be nourished. 
one of my favorite mugs here with my sweetheart. Good, now we are revived a bit. In the minutes remaining to me, um, I'd like to talk about a different topic that is studied in the Talmud that we haven't gone over. We went over property rights and times of prayer and rules of uh, behavior, but today we're going to talk about the dangers of mystical study. Just to refresh your memory, here we have Mayam Tai, again, what uh, Sheldon so beautifully showed you, the Mishnah, followed by the Gemara, with a Rashi commentary, and Tosafot, which are usually his grandchildren, and sometimes more modern commentators on the side. So the Mishnah that I'm going to deal with in Tractate Hagiga addresses the rules governing the command to appear at the temple on three pilgrimage festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And it digresses into dealing with certain esoteric subjects, which are called Ma'aseh Bereshit, the work of creation. And I was very fascinated to hear the use of the word Merkava, which is the chariot mysticism, um, which talks about the heavenly throne as described in the book of Ezekiel. So the Merkava that uh, Sheldon that you showed has nothing to do with this mystical tradition, but they use the word because it elevates. Uh, the tractate does not describe these subjects, but it explains what is permitted and what is forbidden with regard to expounding on these subjects in public. So what they say is, you cannot teach mystical subjects except in very limited circumstances. You really have to honor the boundaries. So here's the Mishnah in Hagiga that says one does not expound upon the subject of forbidden relations in the presence of three nor the work of creation, in the presence of two, nor the chariot, that's the Merkava, in the presence of one, unless he is a sage and understands from his own knowledge. You can't even teach it unless he sort of already knows it. One who contemplates four things, oh, it would have been better had he not come into the world. What are the four things? What is above? What is beneath? What came before? And what came after? All those that take no thought for the honor of the creator, it would have been better that they not come into the world. Very vague language. We don't know what they mean in this Mishnah. So the Gemara speaks about all the kinds of things you should do, shouldn't do. And it finally, on the 14th um, folio page on side A, addresses uh, an Agadah, a kind of story, to illuminate what we just read in the Mishnah. The sage is taught, four entered the orchard. The Hebrew is pardes, which is where we get the word paradise, by the way, <clears throat> dealt with the loftiest secrets of Torah, and they are as follows. Here are the four, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, which means the other, and his actual name was Elisha Ben Avuya, and Rabbi Akiva. Those are the four. Rabbi Akiva was the eldest, and he said to them, when you reach pure marble, in other words, when you get up into those other upper worlds, do not say water, water, although they appear to be water, because it is stated, he who speaks falsehood shall not be established before my eyes. If you understood that, then you are just incredibly smart. Uh, we need more commentary to figure out what was happening here. So the Gemara proceeds to relate what happened to each of them. Benazai, so they all elevated in some way. Benazai glimpsed at the divine presence, died. And according to him, about him, the verse sa says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his pious ones. So they're going in the Gemara, they're going to take far verses to prove their points. That is from Psalms. Ben Zoma, the second one, glimpsed at the divine presence and he was harmed. In other words, he lost his mind. How do they explain that with the far verse? Have you found honey? Eat as much as is sufficient for you, lest you become full from it and vomit. That's from Proverbs. Now, what's interesting is we heard in the medical part about uh, honey being a kind of uh, treatment to enlighten the eyes. So perhaps that is uh, that was from Yoma 83b that Richard met, met, mentioned. 
So that perhaps is why they talk about honey here. Acher, the other one, chopped down the roots of saplings. What does that mean? He became a heretic. Remember in the very first session, we talked about cutting the roots and cutting the branches. So he chopped down the, the shoots and therefore he was separated from Jewish tradition. He became a heretic, but only Rabbi Akiba came out safely. Now in the other column, we have Tosefta. And the story is repeated that four entered the orchard. One looked and died. One looked and was harmed. One looked and cut down the trees. One went up in peace and went down in peace. That, of course, is Akiba. So to understand that, they give a parable. What is this like? To the orchard of a king, orchard meaning pardes, meaning that holy, beautiful place, and there is an attic above it. It is upon the man to look so long as he does not move his eyes from it. Hard to understand. Another parable. There's a street that passes between two paths. One side is fire, one side is snow. If you lead one way, oh, you get burnt by the fire. But if you lean the other way, you get burnt by the snow or actually uh, frozen. A man must walk in the middle and not lean to or fro, not get burnt or frozen or harmed. A story of Rabbi Yoshua who was walking in the street and Ben Zoma was opposite him. He reached him, did not greet him. And he said, from where and to where? Like, where are you coming from? Where are you going to, Ben Zoma? And he answered, oh, I was watching creation. And there is not between the upper waters and the lower waters, even a hand breath. In other words, they're very, very close. As it is written back in Genesis, and this is one of those flowy charts that we saw in Sheldon's example. There's a connection here between the Chagiga and the Genesis. And the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Now a connection with Deuteronomy, as a vulture that stirreth up her nest, just as the vulture flies over the nest, touching and not touching, so too there is not even a handbreadth between the upper waters, that's the sky, and the lower waters, that's the sea. Rabbi Yoshua said to his students, Ben Zoma is already outside. He could see that because he could see so clearly, he was almost dead. And in a few days, in effect, Ben Zoma did pass away. Now, what about the other column with Rashi? Rashi explains that the four rabbis ascended to heaven by utilizing the divine name, permutations of the Yud, the He, the Vav, the He, and through that meditation, they elevated. It was a Jewish meditation practice. The Tosafot, in yet another column, medieval commentary, said that the four sages did not go, not go up literally, but it appeared to them as if they went up. Wow, that is a lot of discussion of something that's dangerous in terms of meditation. Here's yet another interpretation. Pardes, pe, resh, dalid, uh, samech, is an acronym for the four traditional methods of exegesis, which means how do you explain text in Judaism? Here's pardes, the pshat, the simple story, Noah and the ark, or whatever the simple story is, Remez, wordplay, creative use of meanings, artistic uh, changes. Drash, the principle, the applied message, the, the formula. And Sud, the highest. That's the mystical, secretive, meditative uh, understanding way beyond the story. And so Pardes is a shorthand for how we study Torah. And um, perhaps the fact that they entered Pardes means they got to all of these meanings. And for some of them, like for Akiba, it made sense that he came back energized and enlightened. For the other three, it was tremendously dangerous. And they either became heretical, or they went mad, or they died. Now there's more commentary. There's a Kabbalistic explanation of this story that goes on for several pages in the Zohar. I read them and basically it shows how the four attempted to rise through the Sefirot and how they erased boundaries. When you erase boundaries, you're no longer in the world of duality in which we live. And they were so high up that they erased what kept them grounded. That's why you're not supposed to study Kabbalah unless you're grounded and married and 40 and male. Well, some of us are grounded and we're female and we perhaps not married and perhaps younger, but 
the idea of the danger is there and three could not survive. I went very quickly because of the time constraints, but I think you got the idea that even in this Talmud, which speaks about law and rules and timing, there's room for danger. There's room for saying, well, don't discuss this unless you're, you're with other rabbis. Don't discuss this in public. It's too serious. It's too dangerous. So what is the underlying issue in the story of the four rabbis who entered paradise? And do you think there should be limits to what is taught or when they should be taught? Or to whom? I talked very fast because I wanted to leave a couple of minutes for your reactions. I see Anita's hand. Any others? Anita. This makes me think of the um, Koreans who are studying Talmud. They are not grounded in what comes before. So they are learning a good didactic practice in terms of, you know, researching and talking and exploring, but they really don't have the basis in Judaism and Torah to understand what they are studying. So they're getting the process, they're not getting the substance of it. And I think it's really important that we be grounded, you know, not just in Torah, but be grounded in life so that we are then able to go up and explore more. Keep your feet on the ground, even if your head is elevating. Absolutely. Right. Any other reactions to this very uh, famous and kind of unusual passage in the Talmud? How did you feel? Did you think that if you were meditating that strongly that you'd be one of the four? And in what way? I mean, you've heard of people who study and study and they just go, this is all, they get so high that they say, this is all nonsense and there are no boundaries and I'm a no religion anymore and bye bye, you know, that, that happened to one of them. Uh, Patty. Well, this is something that I've been studying and I've been meditating using some of the, the methods of permutation of the name and and it it's quite interesting and I, I have always had a really strong feeling that it's always really important to realize that the end goal is here on the ground that none of it makes any sense unless it changes how we live and how we relate well, the and rabbis I would agree with you on that they would say study halacha study the rules study the mitzvot don't worry about this other stuff don't worry about what came before creation or what will be after there's no more world because you can't know all you can do is affect here on earth just as, as you said very wise reb patty yes any other reactions? These are a lot to think about. Nancy has her hand up. Oh, Nancy, hi. Can you unmute? I think you're just some, in some cases, you're not ready and you should realize that. You know, um, actually my grandfather was a Kabbalah scholar. And, um, you know, when, when I was a teenager, I said, but Poppy, you know, I, you know, maybe I'm a girl, but like, so is Madonna and she's learning. And um, my, my grandma, my grandfather ignored me. Like he just made believe he did, you know, um, and I'm kind of glad because I, you know, I, I think that there's a time when you're ready for these things and there is a time when you're not, you know, there's so your, your kids ask you questions and you think, well, I can't really, you know, I, I'm not going to explain that to them. You know, they're, they're, they won't understand it. So I, I like um, that there's an acceptance that you just may not understand. And it teaches you to be a little bit more patient. Well, I will be giving a very short two session teaching on Kabbalah as if one could study all of Kabbalah in two sessions. But I'll give an overview um, in uh, April, in the middle and end of April. And we'll see, you know, we'll dip our toe into that world as well. Um, some of the things that were not allowed to be discussed were uh, not to lead you into sin, that you get titillated by reading about it and go, ooh, that exists? Hmm. And, and that you might um, just go down the wrong path and that you have to be very, again, uh, grounded and balanced to be able to weigh teachings and, and, and hold your center. 
Anita again? Yeah, there are a couple of books and I've read, a lot of us have read them actually. Um, basically on this, one is The Orchard and that author at the end does come to this conclusion that what they saw up in Pardes was what happens over the generations as they unfold and all the horrors that the Jewish people are subjected to. And that's why um, as Ben as I died and Zoma went crazy and Acher just you know, lost. And, and in that book, it's novel, it's fiction. Akiva does not really come back intact. He really comes back quite changed. And then As a Driven Leaf is about uh, Acher, Alicia ben Abuya, and his transition and uh, you know as as they went through that and then Linda and I talk about also I don't remember which Indiana Jones it was oh the Crystal Skull uh -huh. and at the end of that when this woman whose whole journey has been to find these crystal skulls so that she could have all the knowledge all the information all the wisdom she explodes she explodes I yes. <laughs> can't take it all in. Right. She doesn't pay attention <laughs> to the fact that she shouldn't do that. Reading <laughs> how it led into our own literature and our movies. Sheldon. With respect to the question of who should be able to read what material, we're seeing that play out right now in real time with Mouse about the Holocaust being banned and other books being banned in schools for children in Tennessee. So that question has been around for many, many, many years. Well, that's the, that's the subjugation and the not allowing of something to be read, um, to, but it's in a different way. That's like, to me, that's like book burning. Mm -hmm. That's not saying you're not read. That's not saying this is holy work and you should be careful how you approach it. So. It, Although it's you can't read it, it the, the whole motivation is very different. I see. So what I hope is that we should all stay grounded, we should all stay balanced, and we should all try to elevate through meditation, study, through mitzvot, through discussion with another person. It's said that they sharpen each other, just like knives sharpen each other, uh, that you, you study differently with someone else. And then do what some of us in this group are doing, and that is teaching because then did you see 90 percent you retain when you teach you really really learn it i'm seeing some smiles and so <laughs> continue with our uh, journey of study and of teaching and of sharpening and elevating and enlightening our minds and our hearts in community safely and with joy <laughs> <laughs>